Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Violet and Steel Investigative Business Journalism Awards event, which this is now our eighth year of holding this event, and it's one of the most exciting things we do, because each year we find another group of excellent investigative journalists who have found ways to look into new areas that no one has exactly looked into before. And uh, one of the directives in the judging of the Barlett and Steele Awards is what Jim suggests, tell me something I don't know. We don't just want to learn more about things we already know are a problem. We want to be surprised. So I'm first going to, uh, be, we have a short video we're going to be showing, but I, I first want to introduce you to those on our panel tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, our gold winner for Templand, Michael Graybell of ProPublica. Our silver award winner for the Child Exchange, Megan Tuohy of Reuters. Uh, next, we have the person for whom the award has been named, the Barlett and Steele Awards, the two-time Pulitzer Prize winning and National Magazine Award winning, uh, Jim Steele. We're very happy to have Jim here tonight. Uh, and next, we have Ben Hallman, uh, who wins our Bronze Award for Hospice Incorporated, and he is from the Huffington Post. Now, we should have uh, Shane Shiflett coming, who has also uh, worked on the same project. If you can believe this, uh, he is coming from Colombia, and he was bitten by a bat, and he had to be inoculated before he came tonight. Now, if you're buying that story, that's the one he's been using all day long, so he should be appearing in our guest chair on the end uh, at some point here. Uh, so next, uh, while we await him, but in the meantime, uh, I'm going to show you the video of these three pieces, which are really dramatic works of investigative journalism. And you'll find that over the last few years, the Pulitzers and so many other awards have been won in the area of business journalism by journalists who put together their own database of really incredible events. And so now let's, uh, let's take a look at the video about this year's awards. Workers, children, and those at the end of their lives are the most vulnerable people. This year's gold, silver, and bronze Violet and Steel Awards for investigative business journalism displayed compassion for all of those. Our investigation, Templand, looked at the growth of blue-collar temp work in America. We actually found that temp workers were at far greater risk of being injured on the job than regular workers, especially when we looked at really serious things like amputations. Across the board, temp workers were, were being injured at three times the rate uh, for amputations. In looking at injuries, we told the story of a temp worker named Dave Davis, who died on his first day on the job at a Bacardi bottling plant. Dave Davis was sent to go clean up some glass from underneath uh, a giant uh, palletizing machine. Uh, the, the workers had uh, kind of forgot that he was there and started up the machine while he was underneath it and he got crushed. This, this safety training uh, was just completely lacking there and, and it was something that was repeated throughout OSHA cases we looked at that people didn't think temp workers were their responsibility. And what was really shocking was that while the rest of the world has put in regulations and restrictions to um, address these problems, the U.S. has really done nothing. Uh, you know, there was a lot of work out in the field with workers who were scared to talk to us, scared that if they talked to us, the temp agency would never send them out again. When you see uh, factory workers who used to make 15 to $20 an hour now only able to find temp jobs that pay the minimum wage, uh, this isn't because they're competing against somebody in Bangladesh. This is because uh, companies have decided that, that, that they don't want the responsibility of those workers. And this is something that Barlett and Steele have really been looking at over the last three decades, the, how global trade policies, how tax policies and changes in Congress have led to the sorts of problems that we're seeing today. The Child Exchange was an 18-month investigation that we did at Reuters that uncovered basically an underground market where people went to 
unload children that they had adopted, often from foreign countries, that they didn't want anymore. Children were handed, handed off to you know, abusers, you know, sex offenders, without anybody vetting who was involved. Um, it was an easy way for basically dangerous people to easily obtain children. Our series exposed this one particular couple who had been deemed dangerous by child welfare authorities. They had had their own biological children removed from their custody uh, because they were found to be abusive and neglectful. Um, they had uh, you know, been accused of sexually abusing children they babysat, and then they went on to take like s at least six children th through uh, the underground network, uh, through rehoming. And uh, when we last caught up with them, they had two children in their custody. Um, well, after our serious, ch the child welfare officials went in and, and removed those children from, from, from the couple's custody. Uh, I testified before Congress um, uh, this, this past summer. Um, there are members of Congress who are now trying to figure out if there's uh, you know, a federal law that can pass that would apply uniform protections to, to children. You know, we really looked at and tried to give voice to, you know, some of society's like most vulnerable. You know, they all of these children talked about their belief in America and that it was going to deliver for them and it was going to be a safe place uh, that was going to take care of them. This rehoming activity, uh, this this black market, um, I think really uh, shattered that American dream that so many of those kids had. We found that uh, the, the system of health care providers that are set up to provide care for the most, some of the most vulnerable people in our society, sick and elderly people, are uh, exploiting them for profit. The conditions that you would have typically found in hospices would have been uh, uh, conditions with clear end-of-life scenarios, things like cancer. Now you find a lot of for-profits enrolling uh, patients who have conditions like Alzheimer's where maybe there's a complication that would come in and, and they do that a lot to sort of increase their Medicaid or Medicare billing. But we did find that hospices are not being properly supervised. Um, uh, in some instances, uh, hospices have not been inspected in more than a decade. One of the tools that we kind of developed along with this story is called Hospice Check. It lists all the surveys and violations that sort of hospices have had over the last 10 years. There's nothing like this uh, that exists anywhere else. So, you know, double checking that everything's accurate and figuring out how to sort of dig into the data and make sense of it um, and turn it into something that is understandable to, you know, uh, maybe family members who are looking into where to send their their, um, their, their dying loved ones. Bartlett and Steele literally wrote the book on the industrialization of the American healthcare um, system. And so to be uh, awarded for a story that fits into part of that larger narrative is, I think, a tremendous honor. Investigative business journalism requires extensive reporting, research, databases, and articulate presentation. And it's ultimately about people, as the Reynolds Center's latest Bartlett and Steele Awards clearly indicate. As you can see, it is about people. It isn't just numbers, it isn't just about databases, but it is finding the people in those databases and finding those people who are not a part of the system and who are not watched over by those who should be watching over them. Uh, first, I'm going to touch base with on, about Templan by Michael Graybell. How did, uh, tell me a little bit how you got the initial idea for this. We've got many students out here that at one point would love to do investigative work what rang the bell to get you going after this one? So this oh, microphone. Do I need this? <laughs> Can you yes. hear me? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I had been, this kind of came out of another project I, I did actually a couple of years before. I was covering the stimulus package, the federal stimulus package during the recession and uh, got a chance to talk to workers all over the U.S. who had lost jobs. They were telling me the only thing available for them was temp work or coming back as an independent contractor doing the same thing for less money and less uh, protections. So I kind of uh, came back uh, after doing this work and said, I really want to do something on the changing workforce and doing stuff on, on, on you know, the growth of temp work. Uh, and so it's something that I didn't get initial buy-in and, 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 you know, started gathering string out as I was working on other stories and uh, started coming across these egregious, egregious examples of horrible ways that people were dying on the job, sometimes the first day on the job. And I wanted to find out if this was uh, just something that, uh, you know, was a 
sometimes you know uh, horrible cases, or was this a trend that was happening? And I started pulling data and requesting data and, and requesting cases and seeing that the same things were happening over and over and over again, and that the data did back up that temp work workers were getting hurt at far greater rates than regular workers. Did you, uh, one of the things you'd mentioned, once you actually followed in temp workers one day, right, you'd seen them, you, tell us about that, how that yeah. occurred. <clears throat> so I, uh, as I was requesting data, you know, I, I kind of, you know, my boss said, well, we're not gonna wait six months to, to, for you to do the database and then start doing the reporting, so get out there and see what's going on. And I had been talking to some, uh, a, a worker center in Chicago that works in the immigrant community and they'd been hearing complaints from temp workers that, you know, they're telling me the story of, you know, literally vans will pick people up off the street corner and they'll go work for Frito-Lay and Walmart. And I said, what, that, that, how can that be? You know, that's the, you know, this is, I think of that as day labor and yet this is institutionalized day labor for some of the biggest companies in America. So. We went out to uh, Little Village in Chicago, you know, four in the morning. There's nobody out there except tamale vendors who are kind of getting started to, to feed the workers as they go to work. And people start lining up in an alleyway behind a shop selling quinceanera addresses. And I asked people, where are you going to work? And they said, uh, los peluches, uh, which means the stuffed animals. Uh, and uh, nobody could tell me where they were going to work. Nobody could tell me the temp agency they were going to work for. All I knew is that a guy named Rigo had told them if they uh, showed up at four in the morning, there would be work for them. So they pile onto a bus, and uh, we followed the bus down 45 minutes southwest of Chicago to an anonymous warehouse. There was, there was no name on the warehouse. You know, it could have been all, every warehouse looked exactly like the next one, and we went in, and I saw no signs again for the, what warehouse it was, but there were signs for select staffing, which I knew was one of the largest temp agencies in the country, uh, and eventually got uh, thrown out by a bodyguard who looked like Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, and you know, as I came out, and I sat in the car, and I started you know, looking up the address and looking up property records on my phone, and found out that it was Thai Incorporated, which is, uh, does anyone know who Thai Incorporated is? Beanie Babies, yeah, and Hello Kitty. And you know, if you go to any drugstore in America, you see their stuffed animals. They're one of the largest manufacturers uh, in the world, and they're relying on people who don't even know that they work for them. You know, we had to almost, we had to confirm this with actually like bringing Beanie Babies to interviews and saying, is this what you're working with? And you know, the people say, yes, that's it, that's, that's the company. Uh, the, uh, am amazing. And uh, the child exchange, uh, Megan Tui, uh, this, tell us a little bit about that story because there's nothing considered more precious to everyone than children. And every time you hear examples of child abuse, it just really upsets everyone. Tell us how you got onto this story and some of the aspects of getting it all together. Well, I think, th I think that's right. I mean, I think that investigative journalists over the years have done a good job of documenting the uh, abuses and the failures of the government child welfare system. And uh, what I discovered through this 18 month investigation was that there was this underground network, um, basically this black market in adopted children that exists here in the United States that was completely out of view from the child welfare system. Uh, no government agency, uh, no government officials were paying attention to the fact that there were in the last you know, five years or so, uh, parents who had started going on the internet uh, to find new families for children they had adopted, mostly from foreign countries, that they didn't want anymore. And um, you know, it took, uh, I literally stumbled, started to just stumbled into these Yahoo groups and other online forums where people were posting advertisements for children, um, ads that read, I mean, this is, this, is a, this, is, this is called rehoming, which is a term that was first used by people trying to find new homes for their pets. And um, the language used in the advertisements that uh, I stumbled upon were often similar. Uh, you know, they're, th we're basically trying to find uh, a new home for our 10-year-old Indian boy 
uh, who's obedient and eager to please. Is anybody interested? Uh, and not surprisingly, um, bad people had found this underground marketplace uh, where you know, child, people who would never be able to obtain children through the formal channels were able to obtain children easily and swiftly through this underground rehoming network. And so we slowly but surely started to piece together what had happened. And you'd think, sure, you know, oftentimes, you know, these were children who had, most of these children had been adopted from foreign countries, brought to the United States with this promise of a better life. I mean, they, everybody, all the, the young folks that I talked to uh, who had been fed into this underground network, um, you know, had such, such hopes and dreams of what life in, the, in America was going to be like. And as I said in the video, we you know, really had those dreams shattered. And so I think that, you know, that what, was, what was interesting was that how could you have, you know, there were, no, there were no organizations out there advocating on behalf of these children. This was a voiceless, extremely vulnerable uh, uh, demographic uh, of children. And, um, you know, we determined that it was really important um, to do the reporting. I mean, it was very difficult, but ultimately we felt really important to do a project that would give voice to these children and highlight this uh, massive flaw in the child welfare system here in the United States um, with the hopes that there would be a response. <laughs> you had to do some real sleuthing, and there was one example of a breakthrough when you finally got to talk to one of the perpetrators. Uh, how did that go? So we, uh, one of the things that I was really proud, proud of with this project was that we really got all sides of the story. Um, you know, it was really important for us to go out and find children that this had happened to, uh, oftentimes now young adults. Um, and so we went, I traveled around the country and collected their stories. Uh, but it didn't stop there. I mean, we got the voice of the adoptive parents who had turned their children over to strangers, met on the internet. Uh, in some cases, you know, I talked to one woman in Wisconsin who had, you know, determined she couldn't care for her 10-year-old adopted son and posted an ad for him in a Yahoo group on a Saturday morning and within three hours was handing him off to uh, strangers from Illinois in a motel parking lot. Um, it turned out that the, you know, one of the, the woman who she handed the child off to had had her own biological children removed from her custody by authorities who determined, you know, that she was abusive and neglectful. Um, the man who took that boy along with the woman um, was nabbed by an undercover agent in a pedophile chat room several months later and is now in prison, I think serving a 20-year prison sentence for, uh, ch for child pornography. Um, you know, really illustrating the dangers of what happens when nobody's vetting uh, who's taking these children in this underground network. And so not only were we able to get the voices of the adoptive parents and the children, but ultimately the wo this woman that I've described, this woman who had, um, you know, had her own, she, she actually went by the name um, Big Mama and uh, the online, uh, in a lot of these online forums, uh, she had, Big Mama had, uh, you know, would never would have been able to obtain children through the formal channels after having her own biological children removed from her custody. She'd been accused of sexually abusing children she babysat. She found the under, you know, she, she discovered the underground rehoming network and took six kids over the course of five years. And we ultimately tracked all the different kids that she took in and how she went about it. And ultimately, I think one of the things that people were most surprised by with this series was that she talked to us. Um, we were able to, uh, you know, we tra my editor and I traveled out to track her and her husband down in Tucson, just down the road, and um, did some old-fashioned detective work to find her and him. And she sat down and talked to us um, uh, pretty extensively. And it was one of the more interesting interviews of my career. Uh, we ended up going back again right when we were about to publish and had another encounter with her. But, um, you know, in the end, I think that one of the strengths was so that we did tell all sides of the story. You know, we gave voice to all sides of the story. And uh, Ben Hallman, uh, Hospice Inc., about what happens to folks when they enter a hospice, which is for the end of your life. You had a uniquely personal origin to why you became interested in this story. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, uh, a few years ago, my grandmother slipped and fell in a parking lot um, 
and she was elderly, and she was right across the street from the hospital at the time, and they were able to save her life, but she, she was on the quick decline, uh, and she ended up dying uh, about a week later. And while she was in the care of the hospital, she was visited by several healthcare providers. Um, a rehab center came, uh, and uh, so did a hospice rep. And uh, my father, who was with her at the time, didn't understand why these um, marketers essentially were so interested in his mother, who was clearly on, you know, uh, not going to be around very much longer. Uh, and that was sort of that's was sort of the, the seeds of of the, our investigation into the hospice industry. Um, we later found out that hospices specifically seek out what they call uh, last gasp patients, uh, patients who are on death's door. Uh, in order to sort of balance their books. Uh, most hospice funding comes from Medicare, the big government insurance plan. And Medicare requires that hospice, that, um, hospice patients uh, have six, uh, six months or less to live. Recognizing that some patients may live longer, they've set it as an average, uh, which means that if you're a hospice that has a lot of patients who live one year or two years or three years, as we were finding, um, we found the hospices are enrolling people healthy enough to drive their cars, healthy enough to play golf, go shopping. Uh, in order to sort of balance out those people, uh, they have to find people who aren't going to live very long at all. And um, I don't know, I, di I didn't, I sort of specifically did not investigate my grandmother's story because it felt too personal to me. Um, but we did, in the course of our reporting, find uh, many examples of people uh, who, who were enrolled, uh, who didn't, either, didn't want to be on the service, uh, which is, again, is a specialty health service just for dying people. There's no curative treatments provided. This is, they get, typically get a cocktail of drugs, um, uh, morphine, anti-anxiety drugs. So if, if you're enrolled and you don't belong, or you don't want to be there, uh, it can, you, you can decline very quickly. Um, and, and, and our central character in our story, who I spent a lot of, who, who, whose family I spent a lot of time with, um, that, that was their story. It's especially tough dealing with this because people do not like to talk about death. And when they've lost a loved one, even if it was under bad circumstances, it's still difficult for them to talk about it. How did you approach that, such a difficult topic? Uh, yeah, it was difficult. And... Uh, F finding the patients in the first place was a huge challenge because of the health privacy law that protects medical records. Um, when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I did find a patient who, or a family who would talk to me, you know, I, I tried to approach it um, from the perspective where I would tell them, you know, uh, I, I think it's important to tell your story. I think it's part of this larger story. And, 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 and uh, I, I found that simply that there are people who didn't want, want to share um, I had uh, a couple of interviews that I felt like were really promising in terms of uh, turning into that sort of narrative that I could hang the story on collapse when, when, a, when a loved one decided that, that it was just too painful to talk about anymore. Uh, Evelyn Maples, who I profile in the story, her family had <coughs> excuse me complained to the Florida uh, State Attorney General's office, and that's how I found her. And fortunately, they, they were very uh, eager to talk, and they wanted, you know, they said they didn't, what happened to their granny, they didn't want that to happen to anybody else. Uh, Jim Steele, as I mentioned, uh, this is called the Barlett and Steele Award because uh, they have represented for many years the gold standard in investigative business journalism. So many breakthrough stories and books and such great th work as they have done along the way. Uh, when we first asked them if we could put their name on this award, uh, Jim came back with the, the point that just make sure everyone knows we are still alive and working. So uh, this is proof tonight that he is here, and we assume he's working as he usually is. So Jim, uh, the stories uh, this year, any observations, and, and, and what might you think is different in terms of coverage now uh, versus what it might have been in the past and what you see going forward? Well, one of the things that is so evident in all three of these stories, even though they're all quite different, uh, coursing through them is this real concern for human beings. And it's, it's handled very well. It's like restrained. But it's the facts of each of these stories is, is very compelling. And that's sort of one of the unwritten rules, I think, of all journalists. And, and I think Megan made reference to it in um, the film clip we saw. And that is, 
I think the highest thing we can do is to give voice to people who do not have a voice. And all three of these stories, series, uh, do this really magnificently. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about all three, uh, being quite different, is that all of them have this database component where a very systematic look was taken at each one of these areas. And from that, uh, uh, profiles were developed. And, and this is very important because the objection that you see if you go back many years ago, very often you would find a very sad story of something that had happened to somebody, whether they were a temporary worker or somebody in a hospice. And the story would bring tears to your eyes, perhaps. But as a reader, you wondered, is this part of a larger story, or is this just an aberration? You know, does this anecdote relate to something greater than this person? And I think that's what's so impressive about all three of these stories. They've got the data component as part of them, so we see these are not just flukes. Uh, there's example after example in each of them that shows exactly how widespread and how horrible these problems are. So all of that's very important toward giving gravity and, and, and substance to these pieces. And why it's why journalism today, I think, is so much different, uh, especially a lot of business journalism than what it was a number of years ago. Uh, because reporters now have this sophistication to make these kinds of analysis. But at the same time, they have not forgotten these all important, these great human stories. And to weave those two things together gives you a package uh, that resonates tremendously with readers and viewers. Eight years ago, we had the concept of the Violet and Steel Investigative Business Journalism Awards. Everybody said, well, this is a terrible time uh, in journalism. This is a time when nobody is going to be doing investigative work anymore. We're done for. Instead, each year's entries become stronger and stronger through the growth of database reporting and putting together uh, original information along the way that is just so, so key and so inspiring. Also, each of these stories shows the power of one. One person who cares about an issue and learns more about it than anyone else, the tremendous impact that they can have by following through over whatever that period of time might be. So for uh, many of the, I mean, the students in this, in this room tonight are aspiring to do investigative work, are as, uh, aspiring to make a difference and to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, what, what's some advice that you might have based on your experience? Uh, have there been learning experiences in terms of how you have uh, written and how you put your stories together and done your research that you want to share? I, I was make, I leaving it open, but we'll, we'll come back. Well, I guess we'll come back to uh, Michael again. I'll, the, I'll go down the row. Why don't you start? All right, so I'll start. Um, you know, I guess my advice would be sort of how to start doing investigative work. Um, I think, you know, many of you in your first jobs are not going to be hired as investigative reporters. You'll be hired on a metro desk somewhere. Um, and that's how I started. I mean, I, I wrote obituaries for my local newspaper and asked to do more and more. Um, and when working on the Metro desk, you know, it was constant, you know, breaking news, breaking news. Um, but I always uh, had a project I was working on in the background and chipping away at when there was quieter time or, you know, something would happen and I'd say, t tell my boss, you know, there's more here, there's more here, let's, let's keep pursuing it. And I'd ask for more time why I was doing the other stuff. So I think that's how you can break through. Oh, and that's how I, how I think you can break through uh, and show yourself to have investigative uh, instinct and skills. The second thing I would say is whatever you are assigned to cover, learn where the documents are. Uh, one of the things that, one of the most valuable things that I did as a young reporter was, uh, you know, try to learn how to get police reports, go and talk to uh, the courts reporter. You know, I'm amazed by how little knowledge there is uh, at some of the newsrooms of how to get documents. Um, and, and sort of the key, there's always sort of the, the older person in the newsroom who's sort of the keeper of all information. And, uh, you know, I, I, 
you know, talked to him, I was constantly saying, you know, said, oh, wise one, tell me how I can get this document. You know, I'd, I'd learned something new about how to, uh, you know, which agency in the part of town had it and how I can get it and where they kept the records. And uh, eventually, you know, people came to see me as somebody who go, who could go get documents when news broke. So no longer was I the guy who ran out there and asked witnesses, scattershot, what happened, what happened. I was sort of the guy who's, who, who had sort of run down to the courthouse and get uh, uh, the this, this stuff that would advance the story. Uh, Megan, how did you, it was sort of explained by default, you were in a new job. Explain how you wound up being able to work as long as you did on this story. Right, yeah, it certainly, it certainly wasn't my first job out of college. Um, I, too, started off, I mean, I had a variety of jobs in journalism and started off working in suburban bureaus of newspapers and um, always was looking to kind of stretch whatever existing job I had to the next level of reporting and writing. And the truth is, no matter what sort of journalism job you take, um, I think if you have those instincts and you have those desires and the um, interest and ability to push yourself to the next level, whether it's turning, you know, <clears throat> working on a daily story and at the end of the day you turn in the daily story but there's a dangling issue that you, you know, that you could scratch at. Um, editors are, your, you know, you're ultimately rewarded for continuing to dig and the more you dig and the more you grow and the more you push uh, whatever particular job it is that you hold at that particular moment in time, I think the more support you end up getting within your newsroom because um, editors aren't going to want to stop somebody from gaining momentum as they do more and more coverage in one particular area. Uh, when I was at the Chicago Tribune, I was working in the suburban, a suburban bureau um, doing general assignment work, which <clears throat> on some days included covering like Santa showing up. I mean, there was one day where my editor was like, gee, has Christmas come early this year? It seems like Santa's showing up at the local mall early or, you know, like go off and do that story. Um, which made me want to shoot myself. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, I was doing stories like that, and um, there was a... Um, but uh, as a, it turned out that there was a shooting, a woman got murdered in a suburban parking lot, maybe of that particular mall, um, by her ex-boyfriend. And this was a woman who had been in an abusive relationship with this man. He had been abusive to her. And she had gone out and got a restraining order um, and had basically taken all the steps that a woman could possibly, or anybody could take, to protect themselves from um, an abusive partner, uh, an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, and she still, you know, he still caught up with her. He still kind of plowed through all of the legal protections and murdered her in this parking lot in suburban Chicago. And so that was a classic example where I did the daily story, but then the question became, well, you know, are these uh, orders of protection, you know, how do people obtain orders of protection? What happens if people violate them? Do authorities step in and actually take any action against the people who um, violate orders of protection? Does the, does the uh, criminal justice system actually help to protect these people, these victims? And that turned into uh, my first ser series. I mean, it, one story led to another, and before long, um, I was, you know, working in the downtown newsroom, um, had done, you know, did a year-long uh, series on domestic violence and the ways that the criminal justice system was failing to protect victims. And, you know, that just one, one thing led to another. So I think that it's just a reminder that in all the stories we cover, I think there's always dangling issues that you can continue to scratch at um, if you've got the interest. And the more you do, the more you're going to get rewarded. Um, and ultimately, I mean, took, it was years later that I ended up taking this job at Reuters where I was given 18 months to work on something. But, um, you know, there were a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of stories at the suburban malls before that, so. And Jim, you've got a great deal of experience to draw upon. Uh, tell us a little bit about what drew the two of you together into this multi-Pulitzer uh, National Magazine award-winning well, duo. Well, before I do that, I have to, I, I, what you're saying, Megan, about uh, uh, the way you start is, I think, really very important because uh, I certainly didn't start writing long stories, and most journalists don't. Uh, certain things will pique your curiosity if you want to look behind it. There's a few little rules that I've sort of formed in my own mind that I learned early on that I would just like to 
talk about briefly, because I think they're as true now as they ever were. And I think one of the most important things, uh, which I think what Megan was talking about just illustrates this perfectly, and that is to be curious. When things happen, ask the question, why is this happening? What is behind this person? What, what's the story behind that little item in the paper or something else that goes to the heart of why that's an issue? So be curious. And somebody asked me once, can curiosity be taught? I'm not sure. I think some people are more naturally curious than others, but I think you can train yourself to ask that question. That when you see things, what's behind that scene? What's behind that issue that you don't immediately see? Uh, so I spent many, many years doing daily stories, uh, weekly stories, before I ever did long-range stories. But it, in some ways, it was the frustration of some of those daily stories, wondering what behind these things that then led me into this, the, the long-range stuff. Uh, Don Barlett and I began working together. Should I say the year? Sure. Well, sure. anyway. You can use Roman numerals. 1971. Now, I was only nine years old at the time. No, anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, and we got together on one project. Uh, there was some inner city housing frauds going on in Philadelphia, and uh, the paper wanted a big project. It looked like this was a big thing. Don and I sort of knew each other a little bit. We were new arrivals at the paper from totally different newspapers. So we worked together three months. We did a series of three or four articles. This generated a huge number of other leads. Long story short, we worked on this for a year. Uh, 50 people got indicted. Federal law and regulations got changed over this. And at the end of this, Don and I just sort of looked at each other and say, gosh, that, that kind of worked, didn't it? And so we began proposing other projects. I mean, nobody came along to and says, you are a team, my sons. You know, we've just been proposing projects ever since then. And we think one of the reasons it's worked so well is that we divide the work up pretty evenly. We both love to report, which means we're totally of sound mind. Neither one of us particularly likes to write, which is further evidence that we're of sound mind. And uh, it's been that division that has really been, I think, the heart of the, the partnership over the years. Uh, one person will write a, a part of a series or a part of a story, kick it over to the other one, who knows some more things about that, make some revisions. We've always sort of vigorously edited each other before we put a story or a series together and bucked it over to uh, our editors wherever we happen to be. So, uh, you know, we've had the value of all of these years of sort of perfecting this process. But it worked pretty well in the beginning because of a similarity of interest, uh, uh, a desire to really look deep behind things, to look at issues that might be out there in the public domain, but which hadn't been explored. I'll tell you one quick one on this, and then I'll, I won't go on anymore. One of the things we love doing is looking at issues that appear to be you know, hot issues that which the public is being misled. Well, back in the mid-'70s, I was 11 by then, by the way. So anyway, uh, we were doing a series on oil, the oil crisis. There was this huge catastrophe. People were trying, couldn't get their gas. The Arab countries had cut off the supply of oil, supposedly the U.S. And one of the stories out there, in 1973 and four, that all the media was writing about, the world has 10 years of oil left. 10 years of oil. I mean, look at them. Do the math, right? So we had proceeded to do a story saying, these are all ridiculous stories. And in fact, there's oil crises every 20 years. And every time there's an oil crisis, there's 10 years of oil left. We had quotes from the 19 teens, some from the 40s, and then of course from the 70s. Uh, this got a lot of our compatriots in the, news, in the news business very upset with us because we thought there's all these official people, so this is all the oil that's left. But the point being, look behind Look behind the headlines. Look behind what the experts are saying. Look behind what the authorities are saying is gospel to see if that's right. Because in a lot of our society right now, people say things, and they're not necessarily lying to us, but they just don't know what they're talking about. So look behind that for the benefit of your viewers, your readers, and, and the public at large. Uh, well, Ben, uh, based on Jim's comments, you and Shane have about 38 more years to go in your uh, working together. 
Uh, how did you come together on this, and, and what is it, how do you, what's your lines of demarcation in terms of duties and working together? Well, I was really fortunate to, to well, Shane's, to, to find Shane in, in our newsroom, who is, I think, um, being underutilized, uh, if I can say. He's, he's a, he has a data, uh, he's a, um, has a computer science degree and um, has been a data reporter, and also he's also a developer. Uh, I, these are skills that I don't have, um, that I wish I had. Uh, so, so for us, the line of uh, demarcation came pretty easily. I, I, uh, I do the field work, and he does um, a lot of the research and dealing with the federal agencies, uh, thank God, um, he handles that. Um, and he, uh, he handles the data analyses. And um, so far, it's been a relationship that's worked great. I want to open this to some uh, questions that uh, some of the students may have out there. So yes, over here. Get the mic, uh, microphone over here. Um, so it sounds like you were all very passionate about the topics that you investigated. Maybe you had a personal connection to it. How do you, how do you prevent that kind of passion or personal interest from um, the objectivity that journalists have to bring to the stories they investigate? Take it, whoever would like to. Why me? <laughs> it's all yours. Um, objectivity is one of these words that's subject to uh, a lot of white papers as to exactly what objectivity is. I think in most investigative reporting, uh, you look at the facts as you see them. You attempt to interpret these. You spend months looking at an issue. At that point, I think the readers deserve to know what you think about it. So it's not objective in the same way. I'll give an example, like there, there are all kinds of issues out there where there are two sides of it and there's no permanent thing. Uh, for example, every time tax bills come up, there's issues about whether cutting taxes spurs economic growth or doesn't. Um, you can find people on both sides of that question. All right, that's a case where Okay, run both opinions on that. But here's another, here's a case where who pays the taxes and what their tax burden is, that's all very well established by IRS statistics. So that's something that's not debatable. You can go in and you can run those numbers out and you can explain that to the public. So I think part of the thing is you differentiate between those things where you have a lot of these legitimate uh, opinions about what something may be versus what you can actually prove and show to be the case. But I think the most significant thing with an investigative piece, you're not going to spend that kind of time unless you're going to come to some conclusions. I mean, most readers want that. Uh, there's a very famous story about uh, the historian Barbara Tuckman. I don't know if any of you are familiar with her work. She's written everything from books on Asia to books on uh, medieval Europe. Uh, wrote a famous book on the First World War called The Guns of August. Anyway, Barbara Tuckman lived in New York, and one day she picked up her copy of the New York Times many years ago. Half, half the uh, story was about Palestinians saying this about Israel. The other half of the story was from somebody in Israel. And she ran into Turner Catledge, who happened to be the editor of the New York Times. And she basically verbally grabbed him by little lapels and said, you were fair to everybody in that story but the reader. And I think that's something to always remember. Sometimes by giving both sides, your reader has no idea what's really going on there. Uh, so if there's any way to cut through that, to provide some facts that really explain what's, what's happening, I think that's an obligation we have and we need to fulfill it. How about, how about that, the winners uh, this year was there a point when you were so angry about this you had to sublimate your anger a little bit? Uh, or were you were able to keep a pretty even keel? And at what point does anger affect your reporting in a good or bad way? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I would say that in the, the course of you know, doing the reporting for my story, um, 
I mean, with many stories, I think, where you're um, uncovering uh, injustice, I mean, sorry, injustice, um, and people who have been harmed and the system has allowed it. And at the time that you're catching up with these victims, they, they have yet to receive justice and they're oftentimes still suffering. And I think that in the process of reporting, you know, we obviously form relationships with our subjects and it can be tempting to want to cross the line and directly help people. Um, and I think for me, there can be those moments in the process of reporting where the subjects are just really pulling at my heartstrings and I'm, and I feel like I'm taking from them and I'm not giving anything in return. You know, I keep picking up the phone and asking them to give me more information. And meanwhile, they're maybe they, you know, they've become homeless or they're running into serious challenges in their life. And they, you know, they would probably appreciate some direct help from me. And um, I think that it's important as journalists to just know that ultimately doing, um, you know, telling people's stories. Um, as accurately and fairly as possible, um, you hope will ul ultimately help them more and that that's the role we play. You know, we're not social workers, we're not working for advocacy organizations, and I think that it's just important to, even when people, are, subjects are pulling at your heartstrings, to remember the parameters of the industry we work in and to have faith in those parameters and those ethical boundaries. Um, that uh, sometimes do bump up against your heartstrings. Um, so I remember I would go into my editors and talk about this, you know, say like I'm really struggling. Some of these kids are really pulling at my heartstrings, and you know they'd be like, well, the best thing you can do for them is finish the damn story, you know. So, um, which I think in some cases is true. So sometimes it's just like finish the damn story. That's my and the story opinion. becomes a part of their lives. And I know a couple of my friends who do investigative work. I hesitate when I see it's their phone call sometimes because they get so caught up in that issue that you're looking down uh, the barrel of two hours of talking about, does this make sense to you? Does this make sense to you? Uh, but that's the fun of investigative business journalism. We have another question out here? Someone else? Yes. I was just kind of wondering, in some of these cases, I know you're working with large amounts of data. Um, what do you find to kind of be the best way or what tips might you give to journalists like us who are kind of starting out of how to tackle you know, that large amount of information and how to kind of organize as you're going through these deep investigative stories? You mean how to, uh, so I guess I have a clarification, to get the skills or to, as someone, someone who has skills, how to organize it? Okay. Uh, I mean, so I picked up, uh, I, I learned how to do Excel and Access and I kind of just picked it up because one day I was, uh, so I was assigned a job about uh, rounding up the, the city's homicides. Uh, and trying to come up with an analysis, and I didn't really know uh, Excel very well, and so I was just sort of doing tick marks on a piece of paper, trying to add up, you know, how many people of different races or different parts of town were being killed. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, was uh, a woman who was our computer-assisted reporting editor, and she, you know, she uh, held many trainings at the newspaper where I was at, and I sort of just started taking these classes, which you can probably get at ASU and at IRE uh, to gain the skills. And then once you kind of have these skills, I guess, I mean, the first thing you need to figure out is how do you get the data? And there are many ways to do this. I mean, either reading reports where government auditors have kind of tried to do things, academic studies that have tried to replicate what you're doing, or, you know, just asking around, you know, where is this stuff kept and, you know, what form is it on? If you see it on a form, you know someone putting it in a database somewhere, uh, usually. Uh, the, um, you know, and once you get it, you've sort of got to kind of interview your data where you're going column by column and trying to figure out what does each column mean and making sure you fully understand it 
and then just sort of doing basic checks to make sure you actually have all the data that's in there and there isn't a state, you know, state XX because they, they didn't know what state it was in and they didn't know what the state name was. So you've got to kind of check those things before you dive in. Yeah, I, I just want to, if you don't mind, I just want to offer some very practical advice. If you, you know, get out of school and you have a basic understanding of Excel and access and have some understanding of how to manipulate the data, you're going to go into your newsroom and you'll be way ahead of most of the people you work with right now. And you will impress your editor. Um, you know, I, I think the reality is that despite the sort of data revolution, most of us, I'm speaking about myself here too, you know, don't really possess these skills. Um, and I mean, it's just such a useful, sellable asset. I think that's very good advice. And numbers have always been kind of the Achilles heel of journalists. Um, and I think that's what's nice about what's happened in the last few years. You know, more and more journalists do understand these. They're still in the minority. Couldn't agree with you more. And, and I think one other point on, and whether it's data or information, every journalist deals with this um, pile of information that starts coming their way when they're, when they're reporting a story. And there's all kinds of, everybody has to find what works for them. Uh, and it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by information. Everybody goes through that. So what, what we have always tried to do is, um, the old journey of a thousand miles begins with first step. When you'll see within that information something that fascinates us, we will then write that. And we will very often then not worry about the entire subject, but we'll know within that mass of information we have, there's something fascinating that's worth, that's gonna be part of that story. So we'll write it. Um, so I think that's, that's another thing to think of, whether it's data or just plain information. Also with data in numbers, uh, the thing that's overlooked by people, the power of the numbers is very often just perspective, showing what something has gone from here to there. I mean, the interesting thing about all of these stories, uh, you have whole industries developing that didn't exist, and the data in, in a couple of cases shows that. So that's what's powerful to readers. When you, not that you've just got a number there, but that this is a number that was insignificant 10 years ago or didn't exist at all 15 years ago. Perspective to numbers is, is what makes them so powerful. Uh, do we have, uh, and certainly in terms of uh, the hiring of students, I know in the business journalism area, having uh, the ability to put uh, numbers together in business journalism with journalism there's a great demand for hiring in those folks, and then some of the folks even have double majors. But putting numbers together with words is something that is becoming much more of an expected skill in many newsrooms. Is there one uh, last question we have here? Yes, back here. And then we'll uh, be giving out the awards. So you all touched on giving a voice to those who really don't have one in society. How do you gain the trust of these individuals who don't who already lost trust and hope. Um, that's a very good, did everybody hear that? That's a very, very good question. And I think we've all had numerous uh, experiences where uh, you try to gain the trust of somebody and you try to tell them that you're not there to in any way malign them. You just want to tell their story. You don't want to promise them anything more than the fact you're gathering that information and you think their story is important to be told. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. And there are any number of cases that all of us I'm sure have had where, um, and I think you related one, um, I think earlier today, um, where you work on somebody and you think they're gonna tell their story and then ultimately something happens and they get cold feet or you never get in the front door to begin with. But you just have to try to be honest with people. That's the main thing. And I think usually the honesty will serve you well in terms of uh, gaining their trust and gaining their confidence. Uh, but beyond that, there's no magic formula. And certainly all of the uh, winners this year. I always know every year when I listen to Jim, I realize 
any of us would completely spill our guts to him because he seems so trustworthy and believable. And I know that has worked to his benefit over the years. Uh, part of his great success is his honesty and great believability. Well, this comes the time in our program when we actually make the awards. And so it's uh, one of our favorite, uh, it's one of our favorite times of the year. And uh, I'm going to, Jim will be joining me, Jim will be joining me for this uh, event. And the first, uh, uh, first of all, for the gold award for ProPublica Templand by Michael Graybell. I next our silver award to Reuters for the Child Exchange by Megan Tui. Uh, years ago, I worked with uh, Megan's father at the Chicago Tribune, and her mother worked at Northwestern University and set up many of the shots for a variety of things I did when I was doing television. But many years had gone by, and I was a little disappointed to find out that Megan wasn't 12 years old and that that many years had passed by. But uh, it's great to see her so successful, and I, I know her father's very proud of her and sent me a note already ab about that, so we're very pleased to see it. Uh, it looks like the bat bite story has, uh, uh, it, it's a true story. Uh, it's been explained to me. I'll spare you the explanation of the bat bite, but it was something about the netting didn't cover his foot and the bat had at it. And uh, at this point, what is the he status? Went to the, um, he went to the hospital and it was the first bat bite patient who'd ever showed up at the hospital here, so they had to get the vaccine from I don't know where. So, something to investigate I'm sure, I'm sure for he'll sure. Be fine. <laughs> so uh, I'll mention uh, both names: uh, Ben Hallman and Shane Shiflett. The bronze award for Hospice Incorporated, the Huffington Post. This is the first bat bite incident in the history of the Barlett and Steel Awards. But as you can see, uh, the folks uh, that you see in front of you are people who are inspiring. And I think to them, all of you are inspiring too. Because all of you, I'm sure within this room, ahead of us are some wonderful reporting, some wonderful investigative work, and hopefully in the footsteps of these uh, wonderful reporters, that's something you can aim for in the future as well. Because you can see they did it, and they are pretty wonderful, but they are just people like everyone else. And so thank you to those who are award winners, and thank you to the audience tonight. <laughs> 